You accuse me of calling you insane. But do you have the right to judge what is reasonable and what is not? I have fought the shadows you see out of the corner of your eye. I have seen the faces that laugh at you in your nightmares. I have felt the stinking breath from the moor of hell itself. I have heard the silent voices that make you shiver with terror. I've tread the realms between worlds where time and space do not exist. I've fought creatures whose mere sight would burn your souls to the ground. I have defeated monsters with a chilling gaze that inspires senseless terror. I have fought death eye to eye and blade to blade. I have met the all-consuming gaze of insanity without hesitation. I did all this for you, to keep you safe, to protect future races of men. And yet you accuse me of madness, you whose sanity has never endured such an ordeal. Do you have the right to call me heretic and impious, if you have never heard the whispers of the dark gods in your ears? You are weak, vulnerable, humanly fragile creatures. I am strong, and yet you judge me. You judge me for my sins, you sinners with the blackest of hearts. Only a madman is strong enough to succeed. Only he who succeeds can judge what is reasonable and what is not. Imperium hovered on the brink of destruction. Humanity is surrounded on all sides by unrecognizable threats. Driven to the abyss by the craving for forbidden knowledge, it is one false step away from total extinction. Only the ever-vigilant Inquisition, whose steadfast agents block the paths of nightmares from distant stars and mindless traitors in the masses, protects the people from such a fate. Among the many branches of the Imperium's government, no organization is more powerful than the Inquisition. Its agents inspire fear and respect from those around them in equal measure. The Inquisitors are a cross between flesh and blood men and legendary heroes, unstoppable arbiters of fate who descend from the heavens to pronounce judgment on mutants, traitors and heretics. Almost all citizens fear the icy gaze of the Emperor's servants and feel true terror in their presence. Every inhabitant, from the poorest hive scum beneath towering hive cities to the most affluent noble, is aware of tales of summary executions and purges, of the inquisitors of the Emperor's holy ordos, who possess the authority to condemn or absolve at their discretion. Anyone fortunate enough to survive an encounter with an inquisitor and live to tell the tale typically remains silent, out of fear of drawing the Inquisitor's gaze once more. Agents of the throne are as varied in appearance and behavior as the countless enemies they face. Inquisitors range from young, fiery zealots to grey-haired veterans who have fought in the darkness for centuries. Some dress in ceremonial garb and display the symbols of their official position, while others give no indication that they belong to the Inquisition. As a rule, Servants of Terror carry all sorts of weapons and equipment, allowing them to deal with any foe if necessary. Some Inquisitors use unseen equipment taken from defeated enemies, mysterious devices, firearms of outsiders, and blades possessed by demons. Inquisition operatives have little concern for moral issues and are completely unconcerned with the many laws and procedures of the Imperium, unless they are useful to the agent himself. If the Adeptus Terror is the Emperor's right hand, the Inquisitors are the left, as they oversee all governmental structures. In fact, the agents of the throne stand apart from the rest of humanity in almost every sense. According to ancient custom, they are formally subordinate to the Emperor himself and answer to no one but their equals. Moreover, each holder of the Inquisitorial Seal has the right to recruit for his own needs both lower-ranking singers and entire orders of Space Marines and Imperial Navy fleets. The Emperor's servant's only goal is survival, but not personal survival, as they realize better than anyone that any individual is insignificant on the scale of the galaxy. The Inquisition works to save nothing less than the entire human race. Its agents are characterized by a ruthless pragmatism, a pragmatism that is so unwavering and unwavering that even the faith of the most zealous adherents of the Ecclesiarchy cannot match it. Every Inquisitor is an absolutely infallible judge. To him or her, tradition is irrelevant. Decades of sinless existence count for nothing, and innocence means absolutely nothing. The servants of the throne only care about what is happening now. They are consumed with thinking about the consequences of seemingly unimportant actions. 
The Inquisitors are learned men, but they do not possess any stores of comprehensive information or conclusive knowledge. For even the most experienced agents of terror who have traveled the galaxy possess only a fraction of the Emperor's wisdom. Although there are thousands of seal holders scattered throughout the Imperium, there are so many dangers facing the human race that even ten times the number of Inquisitors would not be able to defeat all the enemies or even achieve a brief respite for humanity. In the darkness, where the Emperor's light cannot reach, demons rage, waiting for the darkness to consume all things. Outsiders advance on the Imperium, destroying entire planets or luring their inhabitants to their side. Even many of the Overlord's subjects, willful, reckless, misguided and arrogant, are unknowingly bringing universal doom closer. Each of these threats must be dealt with by any means necessary, and only the Inquisitors are endowed with the foresight and sufficiently broad powers to do so. Where a planetary governor or warlord would see only a rebellion that needs to be quelled, a servant of the throne will recognize that rebellion is merely a symptom and discern the heresy behind it. The Inquisition has the connections and resources to combat Xenos conspiracies, official corruption, and even genetic abnormalities that thrive in the supposedly sinless capitulars of Adeptus Astartes. A sufficiently astute Inquisitor is able to recognize an impending threat, relying on data analysis or animal instinct, and cut out the tumor at an early stage either personally or with the scalpel of the Officio Assassinorum. Alas, all too often agents of the throne are forced to deal with a catastrophe that has already begun and can only be stopped by the crushing blow of the Imperial Guard's hammer or the indescribable nightmare of Exterminatus. To fulfill his duty, the Inquisitor is willing to go as far as he can and use any means at his disposal. He knows that the destruction of one sinner can pay for billions of innocent lives if it helps end another threat forever. Most of Terra's servants grieve having to commit murder for the survival of humanity, mourn each death and continue to labor only because they understand. Their deeds have served a higher purpose. Other Inquisitors, on the other hand, have suffered emotional burnout and treat the victims as indifferently as pawns thrown off a game board. Yet acts of carnage are sometimes balanced by acts of mercy, for the agents of the throne believe in the possibility of redemption. Sometimes they decide that a citizen's virtue today outweighs his atrocities yesterday, but such reliefs of judgment are truly rare. Ordinary people think that the end does not always justify the means, but the owners of the inquisitorial seal see the fallacy of such judgments. In another era or reality, the agents of the Golden Throne might be viewed as monstrous as the adversaries they combat. However, such a perspective fails to grasp a grim reality. The Imperium of Man does not have the luxury of compassion or moral idealism. Inquisitors, even if they do commit atrocities, are heroes badly needed for their time. It should come as no surprise to anyone that the Inquisition's past is shrouded in mystery. Even the agents of the throne themselves have a vague idea of how their organization was created and are forced to draw from hundreds of conflicting legends. Moreover, there is an entire branch of the Ordo Originatus Inquisition, whose goal is to unravel the tangle of myths and falsehoods that have accumulated over 10,000 years. This task, difficult in itself, is almost impossible due to the actions of the Ordo Kronos who are busy hiding information about the past centuries. The supporters of this faction fear that the enemies of humanity will find something useful in the information about the birth of the Inquisition. However, almost all legends agree that the Inquisition was founded by Malkador the Sigilite by order of the Emperor. It is said that in the last days of the heresy, the first Lord of Terror presented the Lord of Men with four men and women, determined, strong-minded and infinitely loyal, who served the Lord of Mankind well in the years that followed. For everything else, the tales diverge, and there are many theories about the identities of those four. Some versions are ludicrous, many are quite reasonable, but all are completely unprovable. Although the existence of the Inquisition is common knowledge, its operations are almost impossible to trace. Records of them are classified, restricted, or simply destroyed. Witnesses are silenced, telepathically erased, or eliminated on the spot. 
yet those who know where to look can find traces of Tron agents. Many Imperial scholars believe that the Inquisition played a crucial role in such epical events as the Second Foundation beheading and the fall of Nova Terra. A lacuna in the official annals indicates that an entire Adeptus Terra organization had been put to the sword in the past, and who, if not the Inquisitors, had sufficient authority to not only commit such an act, but to keep it hidden from view. Most historians fail for a lifetime to find evidence of Inquisition activity, and the more successful researchers tend to disappear without a trace. Some of them attract the attention of his agents on Earth with their talents and begin working for the Inquisitors themselves. Others are simply murdered, and later their bodies are found in situations that are very bad for the lifetime reputation of the scientist. So the Inquisition not only keeps an eye on the Imperium, but also takes measures to ensure that no one follows it. Since the Inquisition has no leaders or formal hierarchy, any agent of the throne has the right to work for the survival of humanity as he or she sees fit. Similarly minded operatives, however, cooperate in investigations in areas that affect their common interests or concerns. This is how the many Ordos of the Inquisition came to be. The influence of each Ordo within the Inquisition ebbs and flows over time, as Inquisitors may shift their focus depending on the prevailing threats to the Imperium. For instance, during rampant demonic incursions, the Ordo Maleus, specialist in combating the demonic, rises to prominence. Conversely, in times of widespread heresy or internal corruption, the Ordo Hereticus, tasked with rooting out heresy and safeguarding the Imperial faith, becomes more prominent. It's not uncommon for individual factions or Ordos within the Inquisition to fade into obscurity for decades, only to resurface in response to emerging threats they are adept at countering. However, due to the constant nature of certain threats, namely those posed by the warp, heresy and alien species, the Ordos Maleus, Hereticus and Xenos maintain the status of Ordos Majoris. Their vigil against these ever-present dangers is relentless and unending. In addition to these primary branches, the Inquisition comprises numerous Ordos Minoris, each dedicated to a specific, often more specialised or localised threat. Membership in an Ordo does not imply absolute loyalty or a rigid hierarchical structure. Inquisitors, as agents of the throne, enjoy a great deal of autonomy and are free to engage in investigations beyond the scope of their own Ordo. In fact, there is no strict division of responsibilities among the Ordos, allowing Inquisitors to pursue the threats they deem most pressing. This flexibility is crucial, as many within the Inquisition believe that attempting to rigidly categorize the myriad enemies of humanity is a flawed approach. The nature of these threats is often complex and interconnected, with the lines between different types of dangers frequently blurred or non-existent. For example, a mutation epidemic may indicate an alien gene contamination, while a spike in the number of psychers may indicate an impending warp breach. Membership in the Ordos is thus something of a notification of what area of activity the Inquisitor is currently interested in. In particular, if it declares membership in the Malleus, its colleagues will realize that it is preoccupied with matters demonic. An agent of the throne does not need approval for his decisions, as the Inquisitor has no superiors other than those he chooses himself. At times there are elements of hierarchy within Ordos, but very vague and extremely informal. Sometimes it happens that a scholar and honoured operative, who has achieved widespread recognition by his fellow soldiers, is by common consent bestowed an honorary title like Grandmaster. However, such titles are a sign of respect not a mandate for unqualified authority. Other Inquisitors may defer to more experienced comrades with high-profile reputations, but are by no means obliged to do so. Even within a single Ordos, the scope of its agents rarely overlaps completely. The fact is that each branch of the Inquisition deals with matters that can be studied and investigated almost indefinitely. True, in some cases, operatives unite in unofficial groups called conclaves, they are formed at the request of a highly honoured Inquisitor who wishes to gather colleagues with different skills, knowledge and resources to repel a threat that cannot be dealt with alone. For example, with threats such as the Wah! Orcs with a large-scale invasion or a colossal surge of heresy. 
More often than not, conclaves are made up of agents of a single ordos, but more than once or twice circumstances have forced one branch of the Inquisition to turn to others for help. Servants of the throne, namely Inquisitors, seldom directly command combat operations, preferring instead to delegate this responsibility to the commanders of the forces they have requisitioned. Nonetheless, the Inquisitorial Conclave often appoints a representative to supervise the campaign, ensuring that the Marines remain focused on their principal mission amidst the chaos of warfare. This emissary possesses the authority to lead the military effort, if deemed necessary. But most Inquisitors opt to operate from behind the scenes, allowing the Imperial forces to execute the frontline combat. This approach allows Inquisitors to focus on their primary role of investigation, oversight, and the broader strategic implications of their mission, while leveraging the expertise of military professionals for direct engagements. Since each Ordos or Conclave has its own well-defined tasks, conflicts between these organizations are extremely rare. The same, however, cannot be said of agents belonging to the same branch of the Inquisition. The most common reason for disputes between them is the methods of fighting the enemies of the Ordos. Some Inquisitors believe that the enemy can only be defeated by his own weapons, such as using witchcraft against demons. Others see such compromises as blasphemous, giving the Ordos dubious advantages at the cost of desecrating all its labours. Such disagreements are often reduced to a confrontation between radical and puritanical views, but the reality is much more complex. The difference between the two concepts is not absolute, but relative, and depends only on the subjective views of the observer. Few inquisitors classify themselves as belonging to one of the groups, but they label their colleagues as such at the first opportunity. The representative of the Ordo Maleus can immediately declare a fellow traveller a radical, for example, for having subjugated a demon to his will with the help of forbidden knowledge, without even realising that his fellow Ordo members have considered him an unreliable person ever since he read some unholy volume, without even intending to apply the information contained therein. Some Ordo Xenos agents even find learning languages a dangerous endeavour at times, while others do not hesitate to hire outsiders for armed operations. In general, truth is a conditional thing for the Inquisition. It follows from the very nature of this organization that an Inquisitor who suspects a colleague of unacceptable deviation from the path of truth cannot appeal to any higher judge. Occasionally, however, an accuser manages to gather enough evidence to require the right conclave to pass judgment on excommunicate traitoris. Much more often, however, agents have to solve the problem on their own. Given how fuzzy the line between necessary and excessive evil can be, few Inquisitors willingly interfere in the disputes of their comrades. Any spat can cause a rift in the Inquisition, so feuding agents are best advised not to involve outsiders in their affairs. Most of the time such quarrels fade on their own when there is a real threat from the outside, but sometimes they escalate and lead to open clashes between two Inquisitors and their underlings. The ideological struggle between radicals and Puritans is not a battle between good and evil, for such superficial definitions rarely apply to the actions of the Emperor's servants. The radical can save millions of people with his favourite methods, while the hardened Puritan can doom them to death. But unfortunately, no one can predict the outcome of any decision. For example, when an Inquisitor searches the grimoire of the Malefact for the knowledge needed to close the warp rift, he risks letting chaos into his soul and turning into one of the spawn he previously feared. A more conservative agent in his place would argue that such recklessness is unnecessary and try to find another way to stop the anomaly from growing, even if delaying it would kill a dozen planets. In such a situation, the more extreme option seems right. But what if the reader of the Grimoire of Malefact pays for success with demonic possession and subsequently causes even more damage than the etheric rift? Unsurprisingly, most Inquisitors adhere firmly to a single dogma or belief. Once they doubt their correctness, they will find themselves adrift in the middle of a sea of probability and frozen motionless for fear of setting the wrong course. 
Each Inquisitor possesses the authority to declare any individual, organization, or planet excommunicate traitoris, marking them as excommunicated traitors. Those subjected to this decree are ostracized from the Imperium of Man, becoming targets for elimination by any servant of the Emperor or adept of the Imperium. Such declarations are often made during Inquisition conclaves, and in extraordinary cases even members of the Holy Ordos themselves can be subjected to this sentence. The power to declare excommunicate Tritoris is not wielded lightly. It is a principal instrument of the Inquisitors, showcasing one of the ways they safeguard the Imperium within the scope of their authority. The Ordo Malleus, known as Demon Hunters, are dedicated to combating the physical manifestations of chaos, demons. These Inquisitors vow to relentlessly pursue and eliminate such entities wherever they may emerge. The Ordo Malleus's ranks are filled with battle-hardened warriors, for demons cannot be repelled by espionage or subterfuge alone, but require the expertise of those skilled with sanctified weapons and the purifying fires of faith. Nevertheless, the greatest weapon of an Inquisitor in the Ordo Malleus is knowledge, as each one delves into the mysteries of the warp's inception and seeks to understand the nature of their enemy. Gathering information on the creatures of the Imperium, they are trained to restrain and bind the monsters. More often than not, Terra's servants simply seek out the vulnerabilities of the Immaterium's inhabitants so that they can more reliably smash them with demon hammers or illuminated bolt shells. But some Malleus operatives go further, and by imprisoning the monsters in the mortal bodies of their hosts, force them to fight against their kin. Ordo Malleus, tasked with the destruction of any demonic entities, is the most powerful unit of the Inquisition from a military standpoint, as its agents are assisted in their labours by the legendary Grey Knights, Space Marines of Chapter Hash 666. The secrets of their origins, as with the Inquisition, are hidden in the final days before the Emperor's ascension. Unlike the other Adeptus Astartes orders that fight against any enemies of the Imperium, the Brotherhood of Titan is dedicated to exterminating demons and is always ready to assist Malleus's operatives in their long war against chaos. Ordo Xenos not only studies and describes the alien races, but also determines which ones can benefit the Imperium and prepares xenocide campaigns for those who pose a threat to humans. Alien slayers tend to be the most eccentric among the Inquisitors, as they spend years, if not decades, wandering or living outside of human space. Their goal is to ferret out as much information as possible about the races they encounter so that the Imperium can benefit or destroy these Xenos. Unsurprisingly, many Ordo Xenos agents are closely associated with free traders, even share many common goals with them, and often wander in the company of non-human mercenaries or travellers. Many agents of the throne speak several foreign languages, even have acquaintances and informants far beyond the borders of the Emperor's domain. And yet the Ordo Xenos has more casualties to its credit than any other branch of the Inquisition. The fact is that peaceful and supposedly friendly contacts that have lasted for decades are just a screen behind which death sentries raid critical infrastructure depriving outsiders of the ability to defend themselves against the Imperial Linear Fleet's attack. Just as the Order Malleus calls upon the Grey Knights for assistance when needed, the Xenos hunters turn to their military chamber, the Death Guard, for assistance. This chapter, created in the distant past by agreement between the Conclave of the Inquisitorial Lords and the Honourable Assembly of the Masters of the Space Marines' Orders, is composed solely of veteran Astartes, who are temporarily deployed on long vigils from the greatest brotherhoods in the galaxy. The sentries are specially trained and equipped to counter the waves of aliens threatening to overwhelm humanity. These warriors are invaluable tools for any Inquisitor seeking to eliminate the Xeno threat. Ordo Hereticus, Witch Hunters. The agents of this Ordo stand like sentinels guarding humanity from both external dangers and their own weaknesses. The witch hunters of this Ordo's are formidable and sinister individuals. Their skin is pale for they spend many days in the torture chambers of the Inquisition or reading ancient tomes that tell of the essence of apostates and their plots. The secret of the existence of this Ordo's was guarded so fanatically 
that even the other inquisitors for several thousand years knew of it only by rumour. This changed after the end of the Age of Apostasy, when the Inquisition decided that the Ordo Hereticus would be more effective as a visible hammer brought over the Imperium than a myth that could easily be brushed aside. As the Ecclesiarchy grew, so did the ranks of the Hereticus, for no one arouses more suspicion in a servant of terror than another saint who claims to speak for the Emperor. It is not uncommon for operatives of this Ordos to pose as adherents of the Ministorum and servilely cater to this or that cardinal until they have gathered evidence of his guilt. Indeed, it is rare for a priest to be innocent in the eyes of an agent of the Ordo Hereticus. When an agent of the Ordo Hereticus appears, people feel equal parts awe and anxiety. For no one knows who the Inquisitor's gaze will fall upon or who will be suspected of sedition. Hereticus agents mostly watch over the ecclesiarchy, making sure it doesn't overstep its authority in the wars of faith, and the many cardinals of the Ministorum don't take too much power, but they keep a close eye on other imperial organizations as well, Adeptus Arbiteres, the Cosmos, Adeptus Sororitas, and the other Ordos of the Inquisition. Witch hunters or witch finders watch over the spiritual and physical purity of mankind, so everyone is subject to their judgment. Only the most courageous dare to cross the path of a representative of this order, as a single disagreement with the Inquisitor is sometimes enough for a citizen to be accused of heresy and declared extremis diabolus. Ordo Kronos guardians of history. Few have heard of this Ordo, and even fewer who have any idea of its mission to study the effects associated with warp transitions and the passage of time. It is common knowledge that Imperial starships sometimes arrive at their destination much later than their navigators anticipated. The crew ages by only a few months, while centuries pass in the physical dimension there are many legends about such phenomena, but people see them as just one of the risks associated with travelling in the empires. It happens much less often, but regularly enough, that a ship caught in an anomaly of the Immaterium returns to material space before the moment of departure. The Ordo Kronos has a duty to prevent and correct the distortions of reality caused by such phenomena. Inquisitors are guided by the consideration that wanderers who have travelled into the past may disrupt the natural course of events or otherwise damage the imperial design. It is difficult to determine whether Kronos is successful or unsuccessful, first because of the paradoxical nature of his activities, second because all of Ordos is rumoured to have disappeared without a trace. Of course, branches of the Inquisition have disappeared before. Over the past millennia, many of them had temporarily ceased to exist, or had been hidden so thoroughly as to escape even the attention of their colleagues. However, all who have heard of the Ordo Kronos are certain. There is a deeper meaning to the lack of information about it, but no two Inquisitors are of the same opinion about what it is. Ordo Scriptorum. This agency is among the seventeen Ordos stationed on Terra itself. The Scriptorum is responsible for checking and examining various records and reports. It may seem to some that this task is trivial and unburdensome compared to the drudgery of other factions. But such an opinion is fundamentally wrong. The Imperium is constantly groaning under the burden of its own bureaucracy. Due to human error, officials lose or store tiny but vital pieces of information in the wrong places. Far from terror, the governor of a rebellious planet stares up at the sky, waiting for reinforcements, not realising that his request for help was inadvertently stapled to an 800-page message regarding the design of the Lumina. Still somewhere in the interstellar void, an armada of hundreds of Imperial VCF ships hangs idle while new orders for them fly between desks, but never reach the officer authorised to certify them. Ordo Scriptorum identifies only a handful of such problems, but even that is enough to save a billion people from death. In addition, even rumours that the Inquisition is overseeing the work of the Fox are enough to call him to order and attention, and thus reduce the number of such mistakes. The Ordo Machinum, often involved in oversight of the Adeptus Mechanicus, plays a crucial role within the broader Inquisition. 
While there is no officially recognized Ordo Machinum or Forge Toppers within the canonical structure, the concept described seems to blend aspects of the Ordo Machinum responsibilities. The closest equivalent, the Ordo Machinum, monitors the integration of new technologies and the adherence to the sacred Mechanicum doctrines, ensuring that the Adeptus Mechanicus remains in compliance with the Imperium's stringent regulations on technology. This includes overseeing the implementation of newly discovered STCs, standard template constructs, into Imperial forces, and, on rare occasions, the integration of Xenotech under strict conditions. Albeit this is highly controversial and often deemed heretical. The primary objectives of such oversight are twofold. Firstly, to ensure that no defective or heretical technologies corrupt the Imperium's war effort, a risk given the complex hierarchy and the occasional insularity of the Adeptus Mechanicus. And secondly, to prevent the Magos from concealing advanced technologies that could benefit the wider Imperium, thus avoiding the creation of imbalances in power or knowledge within the Adeptus Terra. Ordo Sicarius, Executioners. This entity, founded by the legendary Inquisitor Jagger at the end of the Age of Apostasy, investigates and oversees the activities of the Officio Assassinorum. As part of the reforms, there was established the rule that a majority vote of the High Lords of Terror is required to send any Temple assassin on a mission. Of course, such a restriction is highly impractical, so it is quite common for agents of the Ordo Sicarius to authorize Assassinorum to kill on behalf of the ruler of the Imperium. Some may consider this an abuse of power, but in a nation the size of the galaxy, it is the only way to respond to the countless threats to humanity in a timely manner. Many agents of the throne have single-handedly blazed a shining trail across the galaxy, succeeding through their own decisions and knowledge, but humans by nature tend to seek common ground, to pave a road that can be travelled together, and the Inquisitors are no exception here. There are dozens of philosophical concepts consistently espoused in Ordos, with the followers of each one convinced that it is the one that holds the ultimate truth and the key to universal deliverance. We are not talking here about doctrines, but theories, which the Inquisitors test by every means at their disposal. In choosing which of these ideas to follow, his servants on terror are not guided by religious considerations, but consider all the available options and lean toward the one that suits them best. As the number of Ordos changed over the years, so did the popularity of different ideologies rise and fall. Some of them flare up brightly, but go out immediately. Others have burned steadily for millennia. While the adherents of one or the other often behave like Imperial Creed fanatics, their opinions are based on sound reasoning and tested with scientific meticulousness. Inquisitors are exceptionally pragmatic people, and they would not waste time and energy on pipe dreams. It is not uncommon for these concepts to be so all-encompassing that they encompass several areas of the Inquisition's work at once, attracting similarly-minded agents of multiple ordos. Such groups of Inquisitors are sometimes referred to as factions, which is incorrect, as they lack any structure. All adherents of a particular school of thought are equal among themselves, even if they use different methods to achieve a single goal. For example, a Terrian, someone who believes that the Emperor's soul is capable of transferring into a new flesh-and-blood body, may belong to the Xenos Ordo and seek out alien genotechnology to create a suitable organism. The Demon Hunter, in turn, will scrupulously study the Imperium, looking for a way to channel the spirit of the Lord of Men into the physical world, and the Inquisitor, Ordo Hereticus, will transmit the relevant results of his research to the archives of the Ecclesiarchy. It should be noted that for every agent of the throne loyal to a paradigm, there is a colleague who considers it radical bliss and longs to eradicate it. It should be remembered that the fundamental motto of the Inquisitors is trust no one, and this applies to their associates as much, if not more, than to anyone else. Terrians. This movement originated in the Age of Apostasy, after the overthrow of Lord Van Dyer by Sebastian Thor. Some Inquisitors believe it is clear that the preacher was controlled from above, and the Emperor himself endowed him with some of his own power and grace. 
The Terrians are convinced that the Lord of Men treads among his people, drained from the real world by the wounds inflicted by Thor, he must choose a new vessel to continue his labours. The flesh in which the Golden Throne sustains life is not the Emperor, for he wanders outward and his divine will fills with power those chosen by him. But frail mortal men can only contain a fraction of the energy of the Lord of Mankind. Besides, wounds or decrepitude kill them sooner or later. But what if the Emperor gained a receptacle that does not age or die, a body where his soul will dwell until the end of time? Then the Lord of Mankind, in fact, will be born again and fulfill the destined, will lead his flock to conquer the galaxy. Terrians study the types of interaction of life energy and consciousness with warp, as well as their mutual transitions. Deeply exploring the mysteries of possession, materialization of demons and other inhabitants of the Immaterium. The Inquisitors are trying to discover the laws by which the imps affect the material universe and vice versa. They dream that one day they will find a host suitable for the majestic essence of the Emperor, after which prayers and rites will bring his spirit into a new body, and the subjects of the Lord of Men will again see him incarnate. Opponents of the Terrians argue that even if their dubious plan is fully successful, a schism, more dangerous than any of the previous heresies or civil wars, will break out in the Imperium. Fierce battles would erupt between skeptics and believers in the resurrection. A huge portion of the human polity will be destroyed in widespread religious conflict. If even a schism is avoided, there remains the question of the abilities of the Lord of Mankind. No one knows what powers he gained after ascension, and whether they will remain with him after his return to his corporeal shell. And most importantly, who will guide the light of the Astronomicon if the Emperor leaves the Golden Throne? Opponents of the Terrian are most concerned with the integrity of the Imperium's foundations, and consider the risks described above excessive. In contrast, supporters of this faction argue that the human race is moving to a new stage of evolution, and the Lord of Mankind must lead his people both spiritually and physically. In the third century of the 33rd millennium, Inquisitor Golda summarized his nearly four centuries of service to the Imperium in a work that described and commented on the many events he had experienced. Finally, this agent of the throne proclaimed that the Emperor's righteous services would only survive in the galaxy if they destroyed all other inhabitants. In this era, such a pessimistic idea found almost no supporters. Many decided that the pious but aging Golda had suffered a breakdown and lost faith in humanity's ability to overcome any obstacles. Several centuries later, an inquisitor inspired by the theory of monodominance pledged to fulfill the vision of its original proponents. This ideology, advocating for the absolute dominance of humanity and the extermination of Xenos species, has seen fluctuating levels of support within the various orders of the Inquisition over time. Its followers have absolutely no tolerance for lawless behavior in all its forms. For them, there is no justification for heresy, for furtive reflection, or for aiding and abetting apostates. To heresy they refer mutations and religious schisms, as well as the very existence of outsiders, psychers, and any other creatures that do not conform to the image of a loyal and blameless citizen of the Imperium. For all of this, the monodomination stipulates only one punishment, death. Humanity as a race is fighting a war for survival, and Gold's successors hope that by eliminating Xenos, psychers, mutants, and nefarious humans in sufficient numbers, they will push unnatural selection in the right direction, one where humans will gain absolute power. Monodominants are extremely militant and resort to the final argument of exterminatus more readily than other inquisitors. Unusually, the followers of Inquisitor rarely act covertly. On the contrary, they do their best to stir up xenophobia and hatred in the citizens of the Imperium, even leading crowds of angry citizens in pogroms designed to purge the ranks of humanity of the vile, vile heretics who threaten the future of the race. These inquisitors are utterly ruthless and relentless, stubborn and intolerant. The majority of them are the youngest and most fiery agents of the throne. As they sweep across the galaxy, they leave a trail of destruction in their wake. The first centuries of the 41st millennium were a time of spiritual and material rebirth 
for the Imperium. A significant conclave was convened on a notable but unspecified world, where numerous military, religious and political leaders, among other figures of authority, reaffirmed their loyalty to the Emperor of Mankind. This event inspired a widespread campaign reminiscent of the legendary endeavours of Lord Sola Macarius, who is well known for his crusade that brought numerous worlds into the Imperium's fold. This renewed sense of optimism marked a stark contrast to the periods of turmoil and doubt that had previously plagued the Imperium, marked by internal strife and the spread of heresy. In this renewed era, many agents of the throne supported a movement dedicated to restoring and maintaining the Imperium's glory, reminiscent of the Amalathian faction within the Inquisition. The Amalathians focus on preserving the status quo and ensuring the stability of the Imperium, rather than getting entangled in the pursuit of mutants, psychers or heretics, unless such individuals directly threaten the Imperium's social or political structures. They work towards reducing conflicts and promoting cooperation across the Imperium's various institutions, embodying the principle of unity is strength that is central to the Inquisition's philosophy. As such, the followers of this movement, whether called Amalations or another name, continue the work of their predecessors, vigilantly guarding against any entities or factions that might undermine the unity and strength of the human dominion. Their approach emphasizes diplomacy and consensus over division, focusing on the greater good of the Imperium. They consider change to be the most serious threat, for change can lead to catastrophe. If adherents of other concepts long for some grandiose upheaval or revelation that will lead mankind out of the current crisis into a new golden age, Amalatins prefer slow development. The Xanthites are one of the oldest movements in the Inquisition. It is named after Zoranchek Xanthus, who was executed for heresy in the 32nd millennium. Fellow inquisitors accused Xanthus of worshipping chaos, and though he adamantly proclaimed his innocence, sentenced him to be burned at the stake. At his trial, Zaranchek claimed to have remained pure of heart, though he admitted to several instances of using demonic and otherworldly forces for good purposes. His firm belief that the power of the warp could be harnessed without succumbing to spiritual corruption was later adopted by other agents of the throne. The ultimate goal of the Xanthites is to curb the forces of the Immaterium. They believe that chaos cannot be defeated, as it merely reflects the essence of humanity itself. However, the energy and power that emerges in the Imperium is not necessarily hostile. It can be applied for the good of the Imperium. Xanthus's followers are not suggesting surrender to the Dark Gods. They want to master the very essence of chaos and turn it from destruction to creation. They believe that if humans can travel interstellar through the teeming realm of warp, the true embodiment of wickedness, it is possible to subjugate other aspects of chaos to the Emperor's will. The adherents of Xanfitism study the Imperium in great detail at every opportunity, absorbing its powers and destroying manifestations of the Immaterium only when absolutely necessary. They use chaos-tainted artifacts, demonic weapons, books of forbidden knowledge, and other heretical tools and instruments to combat invasions of traitors, outsiders, and warp creatures. Among the Xanthites, there are some particularly radical inquisitors called Gorians. For them, the death of the Warmaster as a powerful creature overflowing with the energy of chaos means a missed opportunity. Their task is to create a new Horus and infuse him with the power of the Aether so that he can unite humanity and guide it to a better future, rather than enslave it in the name of the Dark Gods, as the Arch-Predator tried to do. Most other servants of the throne believe that the Xanthites, and especially the Gorians, are walking on the edge of an abyss. The general consensus is that followers of this philosophy are arrogant, dangerous individuals who play with forces they do not fully understand. However, the current is one of the oldest, and many of its most learned and highest-ranking agents on terror adhere to it. As such, only the brave or reckless inquisitors stand alone against the Xanthites. More often than not, as in the case of Zaranchik himself, a group of operatives work together against a particular radical in an effort to prove that he has fallen into heresy and bring him to a just verdict. As Xanthites and Gorians deal with demons and warp, 
Many of them joined the Ordo Maleus and quite often forged ties with chaos cults. These inquisitors have been known to form their own sects that attempt to unravel ancient mysteries as well as study arcane legends, lore and other accumulated knowledge. Recongregators. According to this philosophy, the Imperium has undergone decay and disintegration. It no longer fulfills the tasks assigned to it and exists in spite of the efforts of numerous power organizations, not because of them. It is necessary to gradually drain the swamp of political intrigue, numerous factions and clumsy bureaucracy, to dismantle the colossal edifice of the state and put it back together again so that people can live better in it. If the stagnation in the Imperium continues, sooner or later the Emperor's domain will fall to pieces and humanity will fall victim to countless enemies. Recongregators try to destabilize the system from within, replacing corrupt and conservative leaders with more radical individuals ready for reform. However, most Inquisitors are wary of too much upheaval and prefer not to tear down the old world to the ground, but to slowly change it according to their personal vision. Recongregationists most often serve in the Ordo Hereticus, where they seek out people useful to their plans. These agents of the throne often aid anti-imperial sects and cabals, and when possible even influence the views of some cults by planting their own philosophies. In order to achieve the desired reactions and changes, recongregators go to extraordinary lengths when necessary. As one can easily imagine, they often clash with the Almaty people because they hold completely opposite views. There are spats between followers of these movements when they try to deprive a particular official or organization of power. The largest war in human history, the Great Heresy, began with the viral bombardment of Istvan III by Primarch Horus. Although the result of that conflict was the death of entire planets and destruction unseen both before and since, Individual Inquisitors view the Lupercal Rebellion as one of the moments that shaped the future of the Imperium and the race of humans. After the Horus Heresy, the Imperium undertook major reforms to prevent any similar future threats. This period saw the division of the Space Marine Legions into smaller, more manageable chapters, a process known as the Second Founding. Additionally, the Imperial Army was split into two separate entities the Astra Militarum and the Imperial Navy, ensuring no single commander held the power Horus once did. The Emperor's internment on the Golden Throne marked the beginning of his worship as the God Emperor, leading to the establishment of the Adeptus Ministorum, among other foundational changes that shaped the Imperium into its current form. Did not the heresy separate those loyal to Emperor Astartes from the traitors? Did not the age of apostasy lead to the elevation of Sebastian Thor and the transformation of the ecclesiarchy? Did not the glorious battles of the armies of Macarius shine the brightest torch in the dark times of the early 41st millennium? The Horus heresy indeed delineated the loyalist Astartes from the traitors, and the age of apostasy saw the rise of Sebastian Thor significantly reforming the ecclesiarchy. The military campaigns led by Lord Sola Macarius were a beacon during the grim early years of the 41st millennium. These historical events form the basis of arguments by those who might be termed Istvanians. They advocate that it is through the crucible of adversity that humanity and its defenders are forged strongest, promoting conflict as a means to stimulate growth and resilience within the Imperium. Such ideologists perhaps akin to radical elements within the Inquisition, might indeed provoke conflict, believing that constant vigilance, experienced soldiers, and a populace steeled by hardship are essential for the Imperium's survival. This hypothetical Istvanian approach suggests a belief in the necessity of internal strife and external threats to maintain the Imperium's martial prowess and ideological purity. In this framework, Istvanians could be seen as inciters of discord, leveraging fear, prejudice and superstition to kindle the flames of conflict. Their methods might involve covert support of disruptive elements or cults, only to later champion their suppression as a means to unify and strengthen the Imperium's citizens. Such actions, while radical and contentious, would be justified in their eyes as serving the greater good of the Imperium, by ensuring it remains perpetually prepared for the myriad threats it faces. Recruitment of new recruits to the Inquisition, as well as all other aspects of its activities, is not centralized. 
every agent of the throne has the right to recruit into its ranks. Some inquisitors do not do it at all, devoting their lives to the pursuit of enemies and the fulfillment of their direct duties. Others believe that duty, among other things, requires them to take care of the future and train a new generation of operatives who will continue the eternal battle. In this matter, as in any other, the decision always rests with the Inquisitor, and colleagues can only debate it. Many of his servants on terror rely on the will of chance, or perhaps the decision of fate, choosing a suitable candidate, or several from among the people they meet in the course of operations. Some approach the process more carefully and devoting considerable time to finding a successor, sometimes recruit trainees from other imperial organisations. There are no restrictions on age or physical condition for newcomers. The most important requirements are a well-developed mind and loyalty, and such personality traits are usually only apparent in adulthood. In extraordinary circumstances, an Inquisitor may recruit a teenage boy or girl if they show exceptional ability, but this rarely happens. As a rule, agents of the throne pay attention to free-thinking people with a strong will, determined and unwaveringly loyal to their principles. Introduced into the Inquisitor's retinue, they perform one or another unimportant function while the leader assesses their capabilities. Those who perform admirably in the course of working together will earn the greater trust of the Lord or Mistress. Over the next few years, the trainee will add to his or her store of knowledge from the Inquisition's archives, and in time, take on many new responsibilities. Some servants of terror call such semi-skilled assistants Inquisitors, but there are also terms like novice, neophyte, approbator, and hundreds of others. It all depends on the preference of the particular Inquisitor. They may perform tasks in conjunction with their mentors or carry out independent operations, but remain as subordinates until their superior decides to promote them to full rank. Normally, the approval of other agents of the throne is required before the Inquisitorial seal can be conferred and the newcomer given authority, but in some cases such formalities are unnecessary or the situation itself requires the candidate to assume full responsibility immediately. This most often occurs at the moment of the Inquisitor's assassination, when a trainee de facto inherits the seal and completes the master's work. Subsequently, another servant of his on terror may challenge such a promotion of the candidate. In addition, Inquisitors sometimes change Inquisitors by fate or necessity. During training, the recruit adopts the ideals of the mentor, and as a consequence the factions and factions of the Inquisition persist in successive generations, and so from century to century. In addition to philosophical views, the mentors pass on to their apprentices what they know about the inner workings of the Inquisition, or at least whatever facts they see fit to reveal. According to one important tradition, each Inquisitor must find new information on their own and earn the respect of their peers. Wisdom should not simply be shared or accepted, for then it is devalued. As the saying goes, knowledge is power, keep it safe. Since the Inquisition has no formal organizational structure, unlike the Adeptus Terror or the armed forces of the Imperium, there is no hierarchy of ranks and titles. The level of power of each Inquisitor depends on two factors, his reputation and influence. A particular agent of the throne may ignore the objections of one colleague, but when faced with the protests of several, will surely back down. Obviously, many operatives with impressive experience and connections try to subdue younger and less reputable associates. While seniority in age does not mean formal supremacy, most inquisitors default to trusting the wisdom of a more mature and sophisticated comrade. Notwithstanding the above, a group of high-ranking individuals are required to maintain the integrity of the organization to oversee the rank-and-file agents and allocate resources. They are called Lord Inquisitors, High Inquisitors, or Lords of the Inquisition. One can enter their ranks only by invitation from above. To do so, an applicant must repeatedly demonstrate not only bravery and skill, but also decency and trustworthiness. The candidate is always proposed by one of the current Lord Inquisitors, and his choice must be confirmed by two of his companions. Such decisions are always made in secret, and quite often the promotion comes as a surprise to the agent of the throne. 
It is said that it is not men who aspire to the position of Lord Inquisitor, but that it finds those worthy of it. Quite often the procedure for elevation to the title is pure formality, for the word of any Lord Inquisitor is sacred to his colleagues. And besides, the challenger is almost certainly known only to the one Lord Inquisitor who nominated him. In the event of anyone's dissent, however, a conclave is assembled, where the candidates usually, but not always, answer questions about their accomplishments and beliefs. The rank of Lord Inquisitor is more of a recognition of merit than an official title, and its conferral basically formalises the fact that a given agent of the throne stands above many of his colleagues. This is because the Lords of the Inquisition have no temporal area of responsibility. They do not oversee any section of the galaxy or specific individuals. Such a title only adds to his servants on terror authority and powers within the organisation. Among the obvious advantages of such a position is the ability to approve the appointment of new inquisitors, to assemble the highest conclaves, and to dispose more freely of the operatives and reserves of the Ordos. One of the High Lords of Terror, the so-called representative or master of the Inquisition, is chosen from among the Lord Inquisitors that operate in the sectors corresponding to the throne world. Agents who fulfil such a role are called Terran Lord Inquisitors, and sometimes a position on the Imperium's ruling council is shared by several such high-ranking operatives. By itself, the title of Inquisition representative means little to its holder. It is not uncommon to find that a given Inquisitor was simply the closest to the throne world when the assembly was convened. In fact, this title only makes the other High Lords realise that they are dealing with a man of equal status, and subtly reminds them that the Inquisition has eyes and ears even in the most august assemblies. The personal appearance of a representative is always welcome, but his or her seat on the Senatorum Imperialis is often empty, and the vote is cast in absentia. Such are the requirements of the agents of the throne, although the office of representative originated in a compromise between the Inquisition and the other branches of government in the millennia that followed, its servants on terror realised that it was quite useful to have a flamboyant persona at the top of the imperial hierarchy, whose presence reminded officials to keep a watchful eye on them. Traitors and fools so carefully avoid the gaze of this Lord Inquisitor that they do not notice the other eyes watching them from the darkness. Hence, the representative's task is to shine so dazzlingly that the shadows around his associates become completely impenetrable. He must conduct exceptionally ostentatious trials of the most powerful traitors, and in such a manner as to instill fear and ugliness in future generations. Some representatives attend a single meeting of the High Lords, others retain office for several years at a time, some have to leave terror to fulfil their duty to the Inquisition and attend the Conclave. Some, quickly tired of the bureaucracy and intrigue at the top, on which the Senatorum are held, give up their position in the Council and leave for the vastness of the galaxy to serve the Emperor more effectively. Finally, to prevent the representatives themselves from engaging in unsightly politicking, the term of office for Terran Lord Inquisitors is limited to five years. The agents of the throne are almost always unanimous in their support of candidates for this office, as they are no more honoured than ordinary envoys. Representatives rarely speak in the Senatorum, and when they do, they speak not on their own behalf, but on behalf of the entire Inquisition. Nevertheless, they have a grave responsibility. While the formal Inquisition is given absolute authority, in reality, it is vital for it to maintain cooperation with the organisations of the other High Lord. For example, if a representative offends the Fabricator General of Mars, the tech priests can stop servicing the weapons and starships of necessary throne agents for combat operations. In the reverse case, if the Inquisition feels that a particular power structure is not working too zealously, the Lord Inquisitor of Terran should put pressure on the High Lord in question and resolve the problem on a personal level. In fact, the representative has more effective leverage over his colleagues than anyone else in the Senatorum. He did not take his position by choice or out of ambition, and therefore carries no personal risks in negotiations with other High Lords. 
In turn, Imperial officials, well aware that Vane's subordinates are jealous of their position, are forced to hold on to their chair by any means necessary. Because at the slightest hint of displeasure on the part of the Inquisition, any High Lord can be removed by the organization he represents. The Inquisition is particularly vulnerable to subtle manipulation of the representative of high-ranking individuals who hold non-permanent seats in the Senatorum, such as the Speaker of the Chartist Captains or Lord Solar, as their entire branch of government's privileges are at risk. By acting in this manner, the Inquisition carefully maintains a balance of power between itself and the rest of the Imperium. The duties of the representative fall into three main categories. First, he or she must seek the support of any companies of the Inquisition. Second, to warn the Senatorum of threats serious enough to change the agenda for them. As a general rule, agents of the throne are the first to learn of dangers looming over the Imperium by duty. Such was the case with the awakening of the Necrons, the arrival of the Tyranid Hive fleets, and many other epochal events. Consequently, the Inquisition, when necessary, reports to the High Lords on what is happening in the galaxy long before messages from the field traverse the many channels of the cumbersome Adeptus Terror apparatus. Third, the representative must not only pass on the information about the enemy to the Senator, but also propose measures to combat it. Then the High Lords would discuss the recommendation almost certainly make some changes, and the colossal gears of the Imperial machine would turn to execute the plan. The Inquisition is vast, and countless notable individuals have served in it over 10,000 years. Most of them have long since been forgotten, as the agents of the throne prefer that their deeds remain secret even after their deaths. In fact, the Inquisitor's last order to his successor is often to remove all traces of his existence, a handful of operatives, however, have become legends of their Ordos, and the stories of their lives are always told in whispers, respectful if the hero is a role model, disturbing if he once abused power. In truth, in what light the biography of a person from the past is presented depends only on the sympathies of the storyteller himself, and whether his personal views coincide with those of the Inquisitor in question. Tokemada Koteas is driven by one all-consuming desire to destroy demons wherever they appear. Unlike some of his colleagues, the defender of Formosa is unwilling to even think about using the power of the warp for his own purposes, and is determined to punish anyone who does not possess Tokemada's own impeccable spiritual purity. This is how Koteas's mentor, Inquisitor Laridian, died. He was personally executed by his disciple for his interest in the forbidden arts. After replacing the master as protector, Torquemada created a network of spies, enforcers and infiltrators covering the entire Formosa sector. Coteas made alliances, entreaties and threats for the sake of it. Since then, he has rarely used the Inquisition's mandate to requisition fighters and has mostly relied on his personal army. Who knows how many Formosan PDF planetary defense force regiments report to Torquemada as much as their senior officers. Who knows how many hive gangs are operating under his control, given carte blanche to commit petty crimes in exchange for snitching. The sector prefers not to ask such questions, for the curious there disappear in broad daylight. At first glance, the story of Cotier's holding many planets in his fist might seem like just another parable about the temptations of absolute power, but it is not. The Inquisitor has no desire to rule Formosa. He barely keeps an eye on the Imperial governors and does not interfere in state affairs. Torquemada's network of informants only notifies him of major threats to the sector. Such security measures are highly effective. Indeed, how can traitors plot in Formosa when any group of three has at least two of them snitching on Coteas? It is no wonder that the Inquisitor's realm is thriving, even in an era when an internal enemy is inexorably bringing the Imperium's demise closer. However, few are able to repeat such success, for Torquemada is completely devoted to his work. The Inquisitor sleeps little, and every waking hour he reads reports delivered by the faithful Cyber Eagle, or directs combat operations against demons, heretics, or outsiders who dare to invade Formosa. In recent years, the Inquisitor's zone of influence had expanded into the territories bordering his sector, 
and more worlds had come under Torquemada's protection. But along with the expansion of Cortez's domain, his worries have also increased. The Inquisitor is an old man, and like all old men, he fears leaving his labours unfinished. Torquemada is looking for a successor to carry on his work, but none of his acolytes possess the necessary ardour or willpower. Consequently, Coteaz has begun searching for scraps of knowledge about the forgotten science of cloning, the rejuvenating technologies of outsiders, and generally any way to extend their lives in any but one way. The Inquisitor realises that the demons are capable of giving him what he is looking for. It is only necessary to summon one of them and subdue by means of appropriate rites. In part, Tokimada is willing to accept this small evil if it will help to strengthen the foundation of his achievements. Every day, the desire to perform the ritual grows, but Koteas staunchly resists it, at least for now. Fyodor Karamazov is the Lord Inquisitor of the Ordo Hereticus, and even in such a ruthless organization, it's hard to find another man as relentless and merciless. In a career that has spanned nearly two centuries, he has left a streak of blood and fire that stretches across the galaxy. From Salem Proctor to Ultima Macaria, and from Baca to Cypra Mundi, dark legends resound of a ruthless investigator who will stop at nothing to root out corruption and heresy. In his actions, Fyodor is guided above all by an unshakable conviction that humanity even now lives, according to a plan set in motion many thousands of years ago by the Emperor. The purpose of Karamazov's life is to ensure that no one, whether human or Xenos, Inquisitor or Demon, can interfere with this plan. To most agents of the throne, such a task would seem impossible by its very scope and nature. However, Fyodor, fully convinced of both his own abilities and the foresight of the Lord of Men, has no doubts about success. In Karamazov's opinion, if the fate of the Imperium is inherent in the project of its Lord, then the actions of the Inquisitor are an integral part of the Emperor's plan, and therefore cannot be condemned. Many agents of the throne prefer to work under a veil of secrecy and only come out of the shadows when absolutely necessary, but Fyodor is definitely not one of them. In doing his duty, Fyodor either fights at the head of another crusading army or passes judgment on apostates. Karamazov's deeds are devoid of duplicity or guile. In the heart of the Inquisitor has long lived only a deep distrust of people. In all matters, Karamazov is insolent to the point of cavalierness because he believes that warnings to those who hope to stand in the way of humanity to its true destiny must be perfectly clear. Whether Fyodor is commanding a military campaign or rooting out Kramol, he invariably directs his underlings from the throne of justice of an ancient mobile chapel given to the Inquisitor after the Abraxan purges in the year 930 of the 41st millennium. This throne is not only heavily armed, but also quite formidable in appearance, which more than makes up for its master's less than imposing appearance. Of course, Karamazov has long used the pedometer in his trials for extra solemnity and pomp, People who are unceremoniously dragged to the foot of the throne, accused of heresy, treason or witchcraft, end up there for a variety of reasons. For Fyodor, there are no minor violations of sacred law. Even a tiny deviation from the prescribed protocols and procedures is an insult to the imperial design, for which there is a ruthless punishment. Leniency, mercy and leniency have no place in his court. Even innocence is no excuse. Karamazov cannot stand people who, being blameless, have been foolish enough to appear guilty of anything. Such fools are guilty at least of wasting the Inquisitor's precious time, so they are unquestionably taken to the stake along with murderers, traitors, saboteurs and heretics. Tyr. This Inquisitor has exterminated thousands of renegades in bloody sweeps. Tyr is suspicious of all psychers, even those sanctioned by the Inquisition, and so is eager to hunt down and destroy every witch, mutant and sorcerer in the galaxy including psionics of alien races. It's okay if in doing so, it also has to eliminate those who try to protect such vile creatures. Tyr is perhaps one of the most active agents of the throne among those who protect the Inquisition from within. He ruthlessly hunts even his own colleagues if he believes them to be heretics. Quixos. The fate of this Inquisitor, 
once a pious agent of Ordo Malaeus, was forever changed after he was wounded by a demon on the planet Lacan 15. A piece of the monster's claw lodged itself in Kixos's heart, granting him a previously unknown connection to the warp. Soon the Agent of Throne began using the powers of the Immaterium for his own purposes. In the millennia of successful operations that followed, Kixos studied the occult sciences more deeply and utilized the spawn of chaos more often. He chained the demon Karnagar to his sword, stole the Malus Codicium from the library of Ophella on Zandrina Prime, and organized a vast network of underlings and puppets that spanned not only the Inquisition, but the entire Imperium. Although Kixos was probably on the road to damnation, he hoped to accomplish noble goals. Above all, to close the Eye of Terror by enhancing the energy output of Cadia's pylons. Alas, his methods of operation became more and more radical, so the Inquisitor found himself increasingly at odds with his fellow Puritans. He eventually met his death on Farnes Beta, dying in a duel with Inquisitor Gregor Eisenhorn. To this day, no one has attempted to replicate Quixos's experiments, so it's impossible to say whether he was a genius or a warp-stricken madman. Gregor Eisenhorn. He was once among the most zealous and uncompromising agents of the throne, but has become a pragmatic man after numerous operations, including the execution of the renegade Quixos centuries ago. The Inquisitor has long been bound by a pact with a demonic entity named Charubail, and more recently has established contacts with all manner of mercenaries, bounty hunters, freebooters, and other adventurers. Eisenhorn is now several hundred years old, but he still enjoys considerable respect among his younger servants on terror due to his early accomplishments, experience, and authority. Nevertheless, members of the Puritan factions are growing louder that Gregor is no less of a threat to the Imperium than Kixos before him. Inquisitor Liechtenstein is a dangerous radical, and according to almost all of his colleagues, an absolute madman. He has been declared excommunicatus triturus, and is being pursued across the galaxy by one of the most notorious witch hunters in the galaxy, the notorious Tia. Obsessed with finding the mysterious Librarium Hereticus, Liechtenstein mistakenly freed the demon prince Fargatola from his dungeon on Caris Cephalon. Since then, Liechtenstein's fate has been inextricably linked to this otherworldly entity, Tyr and another Inquisitor named Kessel. The three fought on Charis, then on the desert world of Paganicus Limit, where the Demon Prince manifested, and again on Kephalon in the spaceport, when Liechtenstein managed to free Kessel from the power of Puritania. In gratitude, Kessel successfully transported the Deliverer to Equinox, where the obsessive Inquisitor continued his relentless search for the true location of the Librarium Hereticus, but under the pseudonym Travianus Flaster. Liechtenstein, a profound old man with a cold and stern face, but his willpower is overwhelming to anyone who meets his gaze. A spark of lunacy burns in the Inquisitor's piercing grey eyes, but he is true to his goal of saving humanity from enslavement to a historic race of mechanical creatures who revere death. No one believes Liechtenstein, so he has vowed to succeed alone. The Agent of Throne knows that the Librarium Hereticus holds the key to a powerful weapon capable of crushing the ancient bloodthirsty machines. To get the artifact, the Inquisitor is willing to do anything, even enlist the help of Chaos, the sworn enemy of the robotic aliens. The mere mention of the Ordo Hereticus is enough to strike terror into the hearts of the citizens of the Imperium, both malevolent and virtuous. This organization is the largest of the three main Ordo Inquisition, and by consistently brutal methods, it eradicates and punishes heretics and traitors who lurk within the ranks of humanity. Katarina Greyfax is a relentless witch-hunter, one of the finest servants of Ordos. Utterly implacable, cold-blooded, and without mercy, she is the epitome of loyalty to the Emperor. If Greyfax has to choose between condemning the population of an entire world to a gruesome death or eliminating one heretic spreading sedition in a more important sector, Katarina will not hesitate to go there. Her main target is the blasphemers, and Greyfax will destroy them by any means necessary. 
Greyfax, who is implacable in all things and knows no mercy, personally sentences and executes those she deems heretics. The Inquisitor possesses impressive powers of telepathy and thus an innate ability to sense lies. Anyone she summons for questioning should give answers without delay and be glad the conversation won't last long. But while even mind-reading almost always saves Greyfax from having to make accusations and conduct proceedings, her colleagues in Ordus sometimes view her with a certain distrust and hidden fear. Some of them are disturbed by such a radical use of supposed sorcery and the fact that Katarina has not yet reached the highest ranks of the Inquisition is probably due to prejudice against her methods. Her loyalty, however, remains unquestionable, and as such she is highly regarded by Greyfax as a tireless champion of the spiritual purity of the Imperium. It should come as no surprise to anyone that Katarina's formidable reputation is confirmed on the battlefield, for the Inquisitor is not only a herald of Imperial virtue, but also a ruthless warrior. In the sheath on Greyfax's belt, the Blessed Power Sword awaits her, which she draws in one fluid motion. This energy-charged blade has many times cut short the cries of her enemies and swiftly punished those whose transgressions were revealed to Katarina's penetrating mental gaze. Clutched in the Inquisitor's ceramite-reinforced gauntlet is the Combi Crossbow, a devastating multi-purpose weapon whose bolts pierce the scales of Xenos and the armor of traitors, and whose cleansing stakes pierce the pliable muscle and bone of humanity's inner foes. Greyfax's labours are continuous and dangerous, as is readily apparent from her attire. She favours a wide-brimmed hat over a helmet, a revered symbol of witch-hunting in unimaginably ancient times on terror. Katarina's ancient armour, made of dark-blued metal, is decorated with skulls, leaving no doubt about the Inquisitor's murderous intentions. Since her release from the captivity of Thrazine the Incalculable, Inquisitor Catherine Greyfax has become an even darker, more fearsome figure. Even fellow Ordo Hereticus members almost always speak her name only in whispers, and for good reason. Katerinia is endowed with impressive psionic power and advanced telepathic abilities, causing her to be labelled a dangerous radical by many of her colleagues. These skills are incredibly helpful to Greyfax in her investigations and allow her to hunt without any doubts, as the heretics she accuses give themselves away with impious thoughts. What's more, the Inquisitor can turn her hatred of chaos into a weapon, unleashing it in the form of a paralyzing veil of fear and weakness that brings enemies to their knees. Equipped with an ancient power sword called the Tyrant Killer and a masterfully crafted bolter called the Condemner, Katarina Greyfax is a formidable warrior with an iron will. Inquisitor Valeria has always believed that the Xenos Ordo and the Inquisition as a whole should be guided by the spirit and letter of the statement, using the tools of the enemy against himself. Helena adheres to such a rule in every situation. She is willing to use Chaos's tainted weapons against demons and the archmages of those outsiders against aggressive races. Valeria crosses any boundaries of permissible and violates all sorts of edicts because the Inquisition is charged with protecting humanity from itself and the hostile galaxy. This task is so important that for the sake of its solution, Helena demands to legalize any methods of struggle, even the most extreme. In doing her duty, Valeria has amassed a collection of arcane artifacts from bygone eras, fragments and scraps of technological knowledge as well as ancient and alien devices which she has placed at her service. The Inquisitor has spent decades exploring ruins on backwater worlds, studying the many ancient documents in Somatian libraries, and communicating with Eldar, Ulumiat, Draxian, Crude, and hundreds of other civilizations to extract useful information for humanity. The greatest success of Helena's life was to be the discovery of the Forge of Dimensions. According to the text of the Iron Grimoire, this object was first found by Janus himself during one of his early battles. According to legends, the Forge could create a Null Zone, a region of space where demons cannot penetrate, with a radius of many light years. Data on the artifact's location was lost in the troubled times after the catastrophic howl. Therefore, when Valeria's informants reported to her that a Xena device matching the description of the Forge of Dimensions had been found in the world of Hive Kavlok, the Inquisitor immediately went there. 
Unfortunately, the excavation was delayed by an invasion from the Imperium, while the battle for the planet raged, and Helen's occupation was recognized by her Puritan foe, Emil Darkhammer. He considered any alien technology blasphemous, regardless of its origin or purpose. Emil arrived on the planet hive later than Valeria, but he still had enough time to order an exterminatus, ostensibly out of a need to interrupt the spread of warp desecration. All Helena had to do was watch from orbit as Kavlok and all his secrets turned to ash. From that day on, the vendetta between Valeria and Darkhammer began. In fact, Helena doesn't really care that Emil is responsible for the deaths of billions of citizens. From her perspective, humanity as a whole is immortal and there are no irreplaceable people. Valeria is enraged by the destruction of the Forge of Dimensions, learning the secrets that would help finally rid the Imperium of the threat of chaos. Declaring her opponent an excommunicated traitor, the Inquisitor began hunting for him throughout the Obscurus Segmentum, seeking retribution under the guise of justice. Other agents of the throne have not yet chosen sides in this conflict as feuds of this nature erupt between the Inquisitors quite often, and outsiders are better off staying away for the sake of stability in the organization. The Grey Knights, based on their rights and duties, are also mostly neutral. However, if this confrontation does not end soon, the other factions will surely support Emil or Helena. In such a case, their vendetta will almost inevitably shake the Inquisition and ruin the work of several millennia. You say that the Emperor forbade such knowledge, but you twist his words. Rather, he enjoined us to perfect every means of saving humanity at our disposal. It is our duty to catalogue and utilise the wonders of the galaxy, not to hide like timid children behind scraps of dogma. You see wisdom principles. I see only empty messages written by a weak man trying to control what he does not understand. Inquisitor Valeria in an address to Inquisitor Darkhammer shortly before the destruction of Kavlok. Emil Darkhammer. This Inquisitor firmly believes that humanity will only survive if it exterminates all other races in the galaxy. He does not tolerate any deviation from the laws of the Inquisition. When interpreting the Emperor's will, there is no gradation of grey for Emil, but only black and white, darkness and light. All agents of the throne are hard-hearted, otherwise they would not be able to protect people from threats external and internal. But Darkhammer, with his implacable views, surpasses most of his colleagues in ruthlessness. His philosophy is based on the fact that literally anything and everything can be sacrificed to save humanity. One way or another, the Imperium must be preserved at all costs, no matter how many individual citizens or entire worlds die in the process. Following such a concept, Emil made a lot of enemies, not only in the Inquisition, but also in the state of people itself. However, even high-ranking officials are afraid to cross agents of the throne or criticize them, so Darkhammer meets almost no opposition. True to his credo, Emil had ordered exterminatus more than thirty times. Sometimes he has destroyed planets to stop uncontrollable conflict, spiritual decay or epidemics. But just as often the Darkhammer's targets have been a handful of dissidents or outsiders, ancient artifacts or warp damage devices sought by his radical colleagues. Other Inquisitors have long had an ambivalent view of Emile's straightforward acts. Some see him as a beacon of righteousness in dark times, a spiritual heir to the great Golden Gerinimus, who initiated the philosophy of monodominance. Others claim that Darkhammer is only slightly less harmful than the demons of chaos. Emil refrained from exterminators on only a few occasions, most famously the First War of Armageddon. Then, after a massive invasion of the Hive World by the otherworldly hordes of Angron, the Inquisitor limited himself to a program of mass executions and psionic brainwashing. No doubt Darkhammer did so with great reluctance, but by the time he arrived there were still space wolves on the planet, fighting long and desperately for Armageddon. Very few people, even those of the highest rank and position, dare to turn Fenris's warriors against themselves. Their presence was the only reason Emil did not completely destroy the Hive World. Darkhammer's recent act did piss off his counterpart, to the point where the two Inquisitors declared each other excommunicatus traitoris. 
Showing excessive zeal, Emil destroyed the planet Kavlok along with its defenders and the Dimension Forge Xeno device beneath the surface. After that, a full-scale vendetta broke out between him and Helena Valeria, making Darkhammer's job even harder due to the need for constant self-defense. So far, the conflict has not gone beyond direct clashes between inquisitorial combat teams, but given Emil's penchant for radical solutions, sooner or later his duel with Valeria will end in disaster. Fidus Kripman, that agent of the throne who had been the first to recognize the dire threat of the Tyranids, was the alien's most relentless enemy. Wherever another hive fleet crossed the galactic frontiers, Kriptman fought them with whatever methods he deemed necessary. When the living armada of Leviathan invaded the Imperium, the Inquisitor, obsessed with fighting the Xenos, nearly lost his mind. Firmly convinced that his goal of containing the Tyranids justified any means, Kripman ordered the scorching or destruction of several dozen planets. He hoped to slow the onslaught of the voracious aliens by depriving them of the biomass they needed to feed themselves. In the end, the Inquisitor's plan worked. But ever since, the shadow of the trillions of people he condemned to death hangs over him. Soon after a campaign of mass exterminations, he was expelled from the ranks of the Inquisition and forced into hiding. Pursued, deprived of his former powers and resources, Kripman nevertheless continues his personal war against the Tyranids. He is rumoured to have been the one who orchestrated Leviathan's conflict with the Orcs on Actarius, winning the Imperium several precious decades. Undoubtedly, the Inquisitor is preparing a new attempt to push back the Outsiders. The only question is whether anyone will survive to see if it succeeds. Jenna Orechiel. The woman had served the Inquisition for many decades. First as an acolyte of the famous Dargast of Ordo Xenos, and then after her mentor's death as a full agent of the throne. Jenna inherited not only her master's position, his inquisitorial seal and followers, but also a mission of extreme importance. She was to prevent the second coming of the ancient star gods called Catan. Arikiel has a keen interest in other races and their technology, a fact that is strongly disliked by the other Inquisitors. The most conservative members of her order disapprove of Jenna's open use of Xenos weapons and devices, as well as hiring them as her retinue. Arikiel is rumoured to have occasional contact with the enigmatic Elder, and they supposedly even serve her. Nevertheless, Jaina's list of glorious deeds speaks volumes, and no one can deny that she wages the Inquisition's war against demons, outsiders and heretics with an all-consuming zeal. Gideon Ravener had made a name for himself when he served as an interrogator for the notorious Gregor Eisenhorn. Gideon's keen intuition and impressive intellect were complemented by his extremely high ESI potential. After the terrorist attack at Spathian's Gate, he became disabled, permanently confined to a stasis chair, an armoured life support module that allows Ravenna to move and work. Having lost his physical strength, Gideon developed his psionic skills to frightening heights. He subsequently led several noteworthy squads of underlings and defended the Imperium from the atrocities of a host of infamous heretics. Ravenor is also famous for writing a number of books on the nature of reality and the workings of the mind. Recognized as outstanding examples of both scientific accuracy and fine diction. Undoubtedly, Gideon's most high profile investigation is the one that brought him back together with former master Gregor Eisenhorn. Although any Inquisitor is a mighty warrior and a wise scholar, he is still a mortal man with limited abilities. That said, while laboring in their line of work, servants of the throne must fight indescribable adversaries, face unknown threats, and overcome daunting challenges. It is therefore obvious that Ordos operatives often seek out aides and henchmen. The reasons for this are as myriad as its champions themselves on terror. Many Inquisitors treat their followers as tools and simply look out for people with skills and abilities that they themselves lack. Some, on the contrary, see their companions as disciples, companions and brave men to help them carry the heavy burden of protecting the Emperor and all of humanity. Still others wish that someone would understand them and know of their great labours, for the work of the Inquisitor is invisible and thankless. Finally, there are the agents of terror, who acquire an entourage so that they never forget their duty to preserve the common people, who, however, must be sacrificed for a higher purpose. 
In theory, each Inquisitor can recruit any member of humanity. He has the right to command Space Marines and Astro Militarum soldiers to call upon specially trained warriors like the Grey Knights and the Sisters of Battle for help. However, the nature of the Inquisitor's duty is such that he too often has to rely solely on his own strength and resources. If an Ordus operative suspects that a planetary governess is under the influence of the evil creatures of Chaos, who will help oust the Renegade? If the population of an entire world revolts against the Emperor, who will put an end to the rebellion? Agents of the throne by necessity work in the shadows and in darkness. Their presence is not noticed, their deeds remain invisible. Consequently, the Servant of Terror and his retinue are forced to face the horrors of the galaxy alone, for they cannot trust outsiders. The fates of the Inquisitor and his assistants can intertwine in a multitude of situations. Some acolytes are saved from torture and execution by the future master. Others, who initially opposed him, suddenly have their eyes opened. Seeing how saintly an agent of the throne performs his grim duty, these men make a wise decision and atone for their sin by serving their former enemy. Third Xenos mercenaries are attracted by generous wages, common goals, or promises of assistance in personal distress. A servant and its Ontario is able to find a use for anyone. Even perfect outcasts of the state and society sometimes benefit the Inquisition. Sometimes the Inquisition itself finds or even creates such handmaidens, the most specialized and the most loyal, to help its operatives and agents. In some cases, the Inquisitor finds common ground with people whose goals or life aspirations coincide with his own and joins forces with them. In addition, if a servant of the throne prefers to act more openly, he is flattered by suppliants and sycophants who form an opulent court. Occasionally his appearance pleases the Inquisitors, but more often he is scorned. Finally, when an agent of terror takes over for a deceased comrade who did not have time to complete his great work, the supporters of his predecessor are sometimes taken over as well. As can be seen, the Inquisitors, their colleagues and assistants are entwined in veritable webs of destinies and destinies. When their paths cross for the first time, each reacts to the meeting in his own way, depending on his personal qualities and moral principles. Almost any Inquisitor acquires trusted warriors and bodyguards. Where he finds his cronies depends on the personality of the servant of the throne and the area of his labours. Some agents of the Ordos recruit only from the most illustrious organisations of the Adeptus Terra, Scola Progenium, Legions, Scitari, or the Ecclesiarchy's militant chambers, while others prefer people with lightning-fast reactions and animal instincts, such as bounty hunters, mutants of the Padulia, or free colonists of the frontier. But no matter where acolytes come from, they must have exceptional stamina, determination, and loyalty to their lord as they will be tasked with truly gruesome assignments and handling them flawlessly. This service is full of danger, but it is also the first mandatory test for those who wish to follow in the footsteps of their current lord, and some acolytes then become candidates for Inquisitor. Some of the most successful agents of the throne in the history of the Imperium have been known to come from the true bottom of society, but their fate was forever changed after they swore allegiance to their mentor. For every acolyte who rises to the dizzying heights of power, however, there are many nameless individuals who have died a brave death for the great cause of the Inquisition. Priests, always ready to lay their own lives on the altar of Imperium's victory, voluntarily step into the fire of battle, having neither durable armor nor technological weapons. However, the senior officers praised the Ministorum clerics not at all for their combat skills, but for the striking effect of their companions. The fiery eloquence of the clerics, as well as the warlike psalms they spew out, keep fighters from fleeing in the face of a much stronger opponent, or drive the congregation into a state of religious frenzy in which people miraculously ignore mortal wounds and fight with a fervor akin to madness. The Inquisitors are not interested in what causes such phenomena, mass hysteria, or a manifestation of the Emperor's power. All that matters is that they help them win. God-fearing Ordos agents usually keep one or two priests with them just in case, 
After all, if you are going into battle against demonic and unholy foes, having a righteous man on your side can bring success. However, some inquisitors of radical inclinations recruit priests into their retinue with darker aims. After all, dubious matters are better dealt with under a veil of ostentatious piety, and some shepherds have special preaching. Some inquisitors recruit from the honour guard of the Order of the Crimson Cardinals, an ancient and mysterious brotherhood within the ecclesiarchy, known for its unbounded devotion to the Emperor. It is said that in the entire Imperium, there are no more fierce fighters except in the ranks of the illustrious Adeptus Sororitas. Most often, future crusaders are found among the pilgrims who flock from all over the galaxy to the Crimson Basilica. Every pilgrim harbours the faint hope that piety and martial prowess will allow him to rise to prominence. It is a great honour to be among the chosen, though a life of asceticism, constant training and unfortunate death in battle against heretics and apostates awaits them. The Jokero are stocky aliens with orange fur and flexible fingers and toes, quite similar to the orangutans of ancient terror. But their ape-like appearance is completely deceptive. Given enough time, alloys and microchips, they can assemble almost anything from a spacecraft to a food synthesizer. If the Inquisitor manages to attract such a Xenos to his service, it won't be long before his presence is reflected in the weapons and equipment of the entire retinue in the form of minor upgrades. Not all of these modifications increase the effectiveness of the equipment. Sometimes Yokairo merely remodels a device as he sees fit. Such antics often irritate the aliens' allies who vehemently object to the distortion of mechanicus sanctioned machines for the aesthetic pleasure of the Xenos. But few refuse the services of armorers altogether. If Jokar is inspired, he can turn even a modest laser gun into something impressive. If not, he'll just tie pretty laces around the barrel. There's no telling. Whatever the psionics' talents, they are equal parts bringing doom to their enemies and instilling anxiety in their comrades, as mental power turns warriors of the mind into unnatural weapons that inspire superstitious terror in those around them. Many psychers are unwaveringly loyal defenders of the Imperium. Fighting for a state that hates and fears them, psionics draw strength from hatred and prove their loyalty with every victory. Not surprisingly, many Inquisitors employ one or more mind warriors with a variety of powerful gifts. Agents of the throne often treat psionics with more respect and understanding than other Imperial subjects, as there are also many psychers within the ranks of the Inquisition itself. It is true that other operatives, especially those of the Ordo Hereticus, despise psionics as mutants, despite their loyalty. Such inquisitors are only too disgusted to use mind warriors and subject the hapless creatures to indescribable torture for the mere sin of existence. There are rituals and spells to bind the spirit of the imps to a mortal body. Sometimes the ritual is performed only for the inquisitor to interrogate the demons about the warp and the abilities they are given. In other cases, the demon hosts become slaves of the creators. The summoned creature is put in bodily shackles and forced to serve in the retinue of an agent of the throne. Such entities are terrifying opponents, for they are still capable of using various sorcerous skills. But for all the power of the demon carrier, its creation is thought of only by fully confident inquisitors. Demons do not submit to anyone willingly, and the amulets that restrain them are unreliable. Worse, no matter how obliging these creatures may seem, by their very nature they will seek to destroy what is dear to even the most radical agent of Ordos. Another worldly monster that has broken free from its shackles will take great pleasure in taking revenge on those unfortunate enough to be near it, including, of course, the Inquisitor who tried to shackle him. Mystics are lower-order psychers who were recruited for their unwavering will and ability to resist the devil's temptations without fail. Although mystics, unlike warriors of the mind, lack the mental fortress to summon death and destruction upon their enemies' heads, they are quite capable of transmitting a persistent psionic signal. This beacon, similar to the Astronomicon's beam, albeit infinitely weaker, can serve as a guiding star for reinforcements summoned by the Inquisitor. In fact, many terror agents employ entire choruses of mystics on the backwater planets of the Imperium, to better coordinate the execution of their plans and send reserves to the front line. As such, 
These psychers are vital to many of the Inquisition schemes, as being a couple minutes late can sometimes decide the fate of an entire sector. Arcoflagellation is the punishment awaiting those who are declared guilty of transgressions against the Emperor. It is considered far more cruel than the death penalty. Such criminals are subjected to mental processing and multiple operations. Injectors of chemical stimulants are implanted into their bodies, along with an assortment of deadly chains, blades and whips made of adamantium. A pacifying helmet is used to control the arcoflagellant, which transmits soothing hymns and images of saints directly to the brain. Once the device is deactivated, the heretic's body is flooded with combat drugs, substances that speed up perception, fuel rage, and dull the pain of wounds. The arcoflagellant turns into a furious killing machine that feels no pain at all and obeys only its direct master. In this state, it can easily deal with a multitude of enemies and blaze a scarlet trail through their ranks without caring about its own life. If the Arcoflagellant survives the battle, the Inquisitor will instantly return him to a placid serenity by means of a code word until the next attack. Death cults can be found on many Imperial worlds and their ranks are open to swordsmen and noble swordsmen alike. The only thing required of a candidate is exceptional skill with a blade and fanatical devotion to the doctrines of the Brotherhood until their last breath. While many such sects are founded by the forces of chaos and serve only the blood god Korn, there are also organizations devoted to the Imperial Stealer. Their adherents dedicate every life taken to the Lord of Men as if paying the blood debt of all mankind to him bit by bit. For many assassins, it all comes down to swordsmanship. Every little detail has a special meaning if the soul of an enemy is to be sacrificed to the Emperor. It's no wonder that many Inquisitors prioritize death cultists over any other candidate for their retinue. Very few creatures of the galaxy are capable of defeating such fighters in fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat. Many Inquisitors find servitors hardy by nature, unwaveringly loyal, and nearly impervious to demonic temptation to be ideal assistants. Agents of the Throne not only store all their reports and records in the Servitor's secure cybernetic minds, but also install formidable weapons in their bodies. Unfortunately, these declassified human machines have weaknesses. They lack imagination and initiative, and their thinking is limited to the soulless logic of zeros and ones. If the Inquisitor passes out from wounds or is away from the Servitors, they will follow their master's last command and almost inevitably fall into a stupor, mindlessly awaiting new orders. Nevertheless, anyone who has seen a combat cyborg bursting through barrages of devilish fire to crack a sorcerer's skull or firing a heavy bolter while holding the defense after all allies have fled will not criticize the use of these limited but highly formidable and sinister creatures. The rhinoceros machine is one of the most revered forms of machinery in the service of the Imperium. The origins of rhinos are hidden in the mists of the past, but it is known that they appeared in the era when humanity first reached out to the stars and began the long process of colonizing other planets. Since those wondrous days, the design of the vehicle has changed little as it maintains an optimal balance of passenger capacity, armor thickness, and maneuverability deemed infallibly perfect by Adeptus Mechanicus researchers. Unfortunately, in the current dark times, many of the secrets of rhinoceros production have been lost, and many thousands of vehicles are no longer recoverable. However, highly respected organizations like the Adeptus Astartes or the Inquisition have no trouble obtaining the number of armored personnel carriers they need. Not surprisingly, agents of the throne are often sent to active combat zones in the durable and reliable rhinos, relying on their versatility and ease of repair. Some Inquisitors simply requisition the first APC they see but others have their own fleet of vehicles, which, as a rule, include several armoured vehicles of this type among others. The Chimera Infantry Fighting Vehicle is one of the most common and widely used vehicles in the Imperium. Chimeras are characterised by their reliability, tactical flexibility and suitability for mass production. For thousands of years, experts have recognised that in tank battles, these BMPs are capable of engaging targets noticeably heavier than themselves. In addition, the Chimera is equipped with various anti-personnel weapons, 
and its passengers can fire from the upper hatch and batteries of laser guns. For centuries, such armoured vehicles have been used in countless war zones, time and again demonstrating adaptability to the most diverse conditions. The Chimera's highly efficient Vox station with built-in encryption systems comes in handy for the Inquisitor to communicate with underhanded rituals of cloaking and eavesdropping on encrypted enemy communications. Given its impressive capacity as well, it is not surprising that this mode of transportation is used by many Ordos agents as a mobile base of operations, solid pillars in their labours. Land Raiders are still one of the deadliest fighting machines in the arsenal of the Imperial armies. Thanks to their adamantium armour under a multi-layered ceramite coating, they are invulnerable to all but the most powerful weapons. The Land Raiders themselves have a very impressive array of equipment. Paired las guns and paired heavy bolters allow the crew to confidently destroy enemy vehicles and infantry squads. With a passenger compartment that can accommodate the Inquisitor and his entire warband, it's clear why land raiders are considered mobile fortresses rather than conventional armoured vehicles. However, not every servant of his on Terra would choose to use such a transport. Extremely conspicuous tanks, huge and roughly outlined, are completely out of place in covert operations. Land Raiders, on the other hand, are ideal for the more militant Inquisitors, especially Malayus operatives, who often fight hordes of demonic monsters. Even a single armoured vehicle dropping a Tron agent and his entourage into the thick of battle and backing them up with devastating fire can help the Inquisition interrupt the summoning ritual and thus spare the planet from being overrun by the Chaos Warrior. The Crusader Land Raider is ideal for breaking through defences. Breaking through enemy fortifications, it lands an Inquisitor with a combat squad in the heart of the enemy army. Instead of laze guns, each Crusader is armed with hurricane bolters, whose fire sweeps away entire crowds of heretics, cultists and mutants. In addition, this tank has an enlarged passenger compartment that can accommodate even the most numerous or unusual retinue of an agent of the throne, no battle is harder than advancing through the treacherously narrow, debris-filled streets of a ruined city or the passageways of a collapsed temple. With enemies prowling in every shadow, the surest way to clear out a nest of toothless heretics is to scorch it with fire. It is for such battles that the Redeemer Land Raiders were created. They are equipped with giant guns that throw jets of blazing Prometheum into the thicket of enemies. The zealous inquisitors of the Ordo Hereticus especially appreciate this method of destroying enemies. The Razorback BMP is a heavily armed version of the Rhino in which the passenger compartment capacity has been reduced for the sake of installing a gun on the turret. The Razorback simultaneously serve as vehicles and mobile firing points. Such armoured vehicles are perfect for inquisitors who prefer to go on the attack with a small group of selected soldiers. Rugged and versatile, like the Rhino, but with the firepower of a light battle tank, the Razorback is perfectly suited to the requirements of these agents of the throne. The Valkyrie is a twin-engine amphibious assault airplane with decent armament. Thanks to its strong armour, powerful turbines, good controllability, and the availability of different variants of combat load, the Valkyrie is often used in all sorts of tactical roles. Variable thrust vectoring engines allow these vehicles to take off and land vertically, make dashing turns in heavy air battles at low altitude and hover motionless while soldiers are disembarking from the holds on cables. Sometimes Valkyries are equipped with grav weaponry with the calculation for all passengers, which allows them to make an effective landing at high speed. In addition, the capacity of this transport is not inferior to the Chimera, so it is not surprising that many agents of the throne use Valkyries to quickly move combat units to key positions. The Valkyries are also excellent attack fighters, either covering ground forces with devastating strafing fire or quickly gaining altitude to intercept approaching targets. Countless heretics who already thought themselves victorious turned to flee in panic in a matter of moments as the shadow of the inquisitorial Valkyrie swept over them. Her rumbling guns and missiles blasted from beneath her wings, bringing the Emperor's punishment upon unworthy foes.